been curious about uh, happiness. So um, I've, I've, saw, I've uh, looked into a talk you did on YouTube yesterday. So uh, uh, there was a couple of points there that really catch, caught my attention. Uh, for example, what you eat has something to do with thinking patterns and so on. So um, I'm going to ask you about those topics. So uh, first, let me introduce and welcome uh, Professor Mikey Bartles. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time, uh, Mikey. And uh, I recently discovered your research about happiness. Can you give us a little background about uh, why you decided to study happiness? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, and during my uh, PhD project, uh, I mainly studied uh, problem behavior and the development of problem behavior in children. And uh, I actually uh, found out that the majority of the children do well. So there are about 25% uh, it develop some kind of problems, but that means that about uh, 75 to 80% is doing well. And I realized that we actually ignore the part of the population that's doing well in general. Uh, and I think we can learn a lot from those who feel well and do well in the current society, uh, given the complexity of the society. Uh, and if we find out why they do well, we might uh, be able to help those who suffer more. Mm. What did you discover on this path to discovery? Uh, well, one of the, the main findings is that uh, uh, differences in happiness uh, and uh, well-being uh, are partly accounted for by genetic differences. So we have an innate vulnerability or sensitivity to be happier or less happy. Uh, but we also found that large parts of the differences between people are accounted for by environmental factors. Okay. And one of the main factors we are currently finding in uh, our data-driven research is, for example, safety of the uh, the neighborhood where people live. Mm. Interesting. So how much uh, does it depend on the genetics and how much is uh, the environment? Well, it's important to, to realize that if we talk about genetics, that I'm now talking about differences between people. So 40% of the differences is accounted for by genetic differences between people. Uh, but we are not yet able to translate that to individual values because some people have more genetic variants that make them happy while others have less of these variants. Uh, so uh, it's very hard to determine at the moment with a in a reliable way uh, how high your genetic predisposition for happiness is. We, we can do it in practice because we have the information, but it's not reliable enough to, to use it uh, in society as a well. So you do not know how much is the genetics then? Not of, if you look at me as a person, I don't know what my genetic predisposition is. I only know that if your happiness level is different than mine, mm. that the difference comes for 40% uh, by genetic differences. Okay. Uh, what are the common traits for people that have, for example, are more positive? They have also always the positive outcome. They are, what are, what's, the, what's the thinking pattern that you can see? What's the common traits? Yeah, well, in, like in well-being, there are a lot of factors that come together. So people that score higher on happiness skills are generally more optimistic, are more satisfied with their lives. And that all seems, sounds obvious, but um, uh, it's, it, it really is based on research now that that's the thing. Uh, we see, on the other hand, that uh, there's a strong negative correlation with loneliness, uh, with depressive symptoms, and also with uh, self-rated health. Uh, the thing that we don't know is if there's any direction of causation. So do people feel lonely uh, and that makes them unhappy? Or are they lonely because they are unhappy? Uh, and that's uh, the next step, which is very hard to study, but uh, is, is, of course, the, the most important thing to know. But how did you discover that 40% uh, can be genetics? What uh, kind of studies did you do? Yeah, we uh, f first a study that was actually done way back before I was even uh, working at a university uh, is that they looked at identical twins that were separated at birth. So they are genetically identical. So two identical individuals and they never grew up together and they have samples of these twins. And when they bring them together, they assess everything you can do with a human being. Uh, 
also well-being and they found that these twins are more similar in their levels of happiness uh, than normal brothers and sisters that grow up together. Okay. So that's an indication that genes play a role. Uh, then we did a couple of large twin studies uh, where you take identical twins that grow up together and uh, fraternal twins, so dizygotic twins. Uh, those are not genetically identical. And then you see that identical twins are more similar in their levels of well-being than ident- uh, fraternal twins. And that provides you with the estimate of 40%. And then in the next steps, we uh, dig into uh, real molecular genetic material, so DNA taken from people. And with that uh, kind of studies, we are able to recover about 10 to 12% of this 40% in the current DNA samples with the current methodology. So for example, if I'm a person that always have a positive outcome, I always think, okay, everything's going to be okay, it's going to be all right, and I'm always positive. Is there something um, something different with my genetics from a person that always thinking, oh, this is going to go bad, oh, this is going to go terrible? Yeah, yeah, probably you have uh, at, at certain spots, we, we now identified over 300 locations on the human genome, so in our DNA sequence, that explain these differences between people. So uh, indeed, if some people are more optimistic in general, uh, see the glass half full uh, instead of half empty, they probably have at some locations in the genome uh, a, di- a different uh, base pair than on other locations, than other people that see the glass half empty. Are there uh, something different? Are there um, different categories? For example, one person can be extremely positive and then some people can be in, in the middle of the range, and some people can be very depressed and always see the bad outcome. Are there different uh, levels of uh, being, being yeah, happy? We always, uh, yeah, we always work with uh, a continuous scale. So we always work with not like uh, you, you are either happy or depressed or optimistic or pessimistic, always on a continuous scale. Uh, and given that we already found 300 locations, you also see that... Uh, that's also on a scale. Some people have a lot of positive uh, genes for their well-being, while others are in the middle, and uh, some have only a few. So uh, it's always on a quantitative scale. So it's not that there's a certain cut point and say, okay, this group is happy and this group is not happy. And it's always your genetic predisposition always works in interplay with your environment. So even if two people have the same genes, like identical twins, they still have different interactions with their environment or different exposures. So the real feelings of identical twins is, of course, not completely identical. So what uh, does epigenetics matter in this uh, in happiness? Yeah, well, we're not sure yet. We, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, conducted the first epigenetic study, uh, and we found some uh, epigenetic differences between happy and uh, less happy people. Uh, But that was a relatively small study. Uh, We are now replicated this with a very large sample with different samples uh, from all around the world. Uh, And it's not really convincing as of yet. Um, And one of the major reasons is that, uh, first of all, uh, well-being is complex or happiness is complex to measure. And epigenetics is is very sensitive. We look at DNA methylation. And DNA methylation is, for example, also very much influenced by smoking behavior. So you see effects that are, for example, related to smoking. And there is also a relation between smoking and well-being. But okay. it's very hard to sort out uh, what is the real effect and what's actually uh, like a confounding effect. But what correlation do you find between smoking and happiness? Well, in general, people that smoke are less happy than people that do not smoke and people that stopped smoking are in between hmm. interesting is it possible if you're a negative person uh, is it possible to turn that gene on to be more positive if you do something uh, from exercises or mm-hmm. whatever it is is that possible well, it's it's for sure possible to change your level of happiness uh, regardless of talking about turning on and off gene so if you have the distribution of happiness from low to high happiness and everybody's training their happiness level, you will switch the whole distribution to the better side. So the differences will stay, but you can train everybody. Like with physical exercise, everybody starts running. They all uh, get, get into better physical shape. Some more than others, but they all shift a bit. Um, it's 
I think it's hard to ever find real evidence that it has to do with turning on and off gene expression, given that it's at that many locations. And the locations we find for happiness are sometimes also important for something else. So our uh, genetic playground is very complex. Are there any correlation between people that exercise and happiness? Yeah, there is a relation, but um, we see uh, that there is not a causal relation. If you look at the population, there you always see a relation. So people that exercise more are happier. But we don't know. What we don't see is that if you go exercising, that you become happier. So there's a certain uh, sensitivity or a genetic predisposition that makes you an exerciser and makes you happy. And maybe it has to do with the social interaction or with the self-control. Or And maybe for some people it's the social interaction and for other people it's the self-control. However, if you look at clinical samples, so for example, samples with people with depressive symptoms, uh, exer- exercise interface, Inventions have a positive effect. Then it's very interesting to know if if it's because they have this gene that they are exercising in the first point, or it's because yeah, yeah that's pretty interesting. Yeah, probably, <laughs> yeah, the thing is, it's it's probably uh, different for each individual. So some individuals are happy and have the energy to start exercising, while others are exercising and become happy due to the exercising. And some people don't have a link, so it's it's due to the fact that genes are involved and genes are individual specific. We can't claim one big association to be one big effect. Does the energy level have something to do with happiness? I don't know. I don't know the studies that really tested energy levels. Um, you can imagine that uh, you, you observe in the population that there are differences in energy level between individuals. So that's clear. Uh, if you see uh, these individual differences, you can already assume that part of these differences are accounted for by genetic differences. Uh, that's actually for any human trait. Uh, and it's easier to, to do a lot of things when you have more energy. So I can imagine there is a relation. I'm not aware of a study that really shows an association. Are there any studies about what people eat if they're more happy? Uh, not studies that I completely trust, I must say. Uh, so it's either smaller studies or it's studies that uh, picked some random, like vegetables, for example, mm. already based on a predefined hypothesis. Uh, and I don't think there is a general outcome that's, uh, that, all, that a certain food is important for everybody's happiness. So it really depends on your own uh, metabolic system. Uh, what kind of food fits you best? I heard in an uh, interview that uh, I saw with you, and you have four kids. So I'm curious. I have two of them, and uh, am I more happy because I have kids? Um, I, I, that's also a very complex <laughs> relationship. <laughs> Everybody with kids knows that they make you happy sometimes, and that they also make you very unhappy at other time points. But uh, uh, Large studies show that in the beginning, when they're very young, people uh, are a bit unhappier. Uh, While when they are older and more independent, uh, the people with children are happier. Uh, But it it really depends because, for example, the the group that has children is very uh, uh, different from each other. And, uh, of course, also the group without children uh, is a very heterogeneous group with people that voluntarily decide not to have children, but also people uh, that regretfully are not able to get children. So it's a very complex uh, comparison. And it really depends like, on the health and the well-being of your child as well. If, if your child is healthy and, and doing well, uh, it's way easier to raise your children than if you are in a more complex situation. Of course. If you have a personality that is uh, high in neuro- neuro- neuroticism, <laughs> neuro- yep, yep, yes, yeah. uh, does that have any correlation between that and happiness? Yeah, there's a relatively strong correlation, a negative one between a neuroticism and well-being. So, um, so higher on neuroticism and uh, close to uh, uh, having clinical som- uh, symptoms uh, makes you unhappy or is linked to an unhappier uh, phenotype. What about openness? 
Openness is very complex. The studies are a bit conflicting. Some studies show that, uh, uh, and I think that's because it's not a linear relationship. So it's good to have a certain level of openness, but not too much because then it's, it, you run into problems as well. And probably for the neuroticism, uh, that's also a bit the case. So it's not too bad to be a bit neurotic uh, to keep your life under control, but it shouldn't be too extreme. Are there any differences between uh, extroversion and introversion? There are differences uh, in well-being, but also uh, mainly in uh, environmental exposure. So well-being is this interplay of genes and environment. And if you are a, a, an extrovert, you have a different environmental exposure. Uh, so if people really follow their personality, they are probably uh, similarly happy. So introverts are happy if they can follow an introvert life and extroverts are happy when they can follow an extrovert life. But society is of course uh, putting uh, expectations on people. Uh, and I think especially for more introverted people, that's harder because there's a lot of expectation of social involvement. Um, and it, so it's harder to live their life according to their own personalities. So because of the society we have, it's uh, the extroverted people are more happy than because of how the society is. Yeah, I think they have an easier life in our society. And that's also what I always uh, propose as something that uh, would have a major shift for people, their own happiness, but also for society. If we would have a more uh, inclusive society where people can make their own decisions and be who they are. Uh, we always say, for example, in the Netherlands, that we are a very liberal society and everybody can do whatever he wants. And that's, of course, not, not true. Our so school system is very fixed. Expectations are very fixed. And I think if we would be way more open about that, uh, it would be easier for people to, to just find their own path that fits their own personality and, and that would make them happier. Does money make you happy then? Um, there are studies uh, from the field of economics that show that there is a certain amount uh, or there's a basic amount. Uh, so you have to have enough money to, to live a, a relatively normal life. To, that's, that's uh, of course, uh, logical. Uh, and they also say that there is an upper level, but they never talk about individual differences. So as you can imagine, if you look at your own peer group, for example, some people are way more materialistic than other people and they need more money to be happy than other people. And it's hard to decide, so I can decide for, for example, for my own children, I see differences. Uh, they live, grow up in the same family. They're from the same parents. But one really likes to have the newest iPhone, while the other one doesn't care at all. Uh, so I always say to my oldest as a daughter, I say, well, you have, will have a hard life because you need a lot of money to be happy. And the third one is just, she, she doesn't need anything. So uh, it's, it's and, and it, that's not it because I raised them differently. It's because they are different. Uh, so money is a complex thing. Some people say I'm poor while they have a lot of money and live a very luxurious life. What I consider luxurious, but other people say, well, I, I need way more money for mm. less. I'm curious about the thinking patterns that the people that uh, are more happy have. What do happy people think? That's hard. I don't know. I, I assume, but we haven't tested it yet. Um, I think that they are a bit more self-confident and um, um, follow their own feelings and behaviors more than people that are less happy. So they are more independent. But that's that's also what I hope that it's that is the case because you can help people to become independent and follow their own paths. In this uh, research, have there been any questions about what is really happiness for that person? That's a good question. It's always a discussion. What's the definition of happiness? Um, no, we didn't do this yet because we are currently uh, doing this huge population study. So you need very large samples uh, and closed questions. Otherwise, uh, there's too much information. But the next step will be to discuss at an individual level uh, what happiness means to people. Uh, the, the nice thing is, is that everybody is pretty
pretty well able to rate their level. So they know if they feel well. And the next step indeed is to, to sort out, but why do you feel well? And then you get all these different answers. And hopefully we will find some kind of pattern uh, in these answers because everybody is, is different. But I think there are groups of people that are happy due to the same reasons. When you talk about happiness, where can we find happiness? Is it in the stomach or is it in the brain or where is happiness? Have you found uh, where it is? Well, there was a very nice study a couple of years ago, but they tried to replicate and it didn't work. But the, the finding was nice. What they did, they asked people to, uh, at, a, at a, a miniature person, draw where they feel certain emotions. So if people were angry and they, they put it all together and then you they showed that when people are angry, you feel it in your fists and in your head. And when people uh, feel ashamed, they feel it in their face. Uh, and happiness was the only thing that people felt throughout their whole body. Interesting. Um, so that was a very interesting finding. The pity is when they replicated it, it was less clear that it was, it was happiness. It was the only emotion. Uh, but I think, of course, most most emotions and feelings uh, start in the brain, uh, but can be felt, like we know, uh, throughout your body. Hmm. What do you find most interesting about this research? Uh, um well uh, it's fascinating to me that uh genes play a role but it's also fascinating to me uh to see these effects in the interaction with the environment um and i hope that it helps people to accept that we are all different so it's not the genetic part is complex and we made a lot of progress and but it doesn't mean it can't change so it doesn't mean you cannot make people happier. It only means that we have to respect the differences and that we have to understand each other better. Um, so we assume a lot of people do certain things, make certain choices. We always are very judgmental. Uh, and hopefully uh, it helps to overcome uh, all these judgments and say, well, you have to be happy because you have a nice house and a nice job. That doesn't help people if they don't feel happy. <laughs> Then I'm curious about uh, self-help books because it's sold a lot of self-help books. Uh, yeah. Does, do they help? Well, I always say um, you can give it a try. Uh, and of course, you shouldn't buy them all because that's very expensive. But uh, you can just in the bookstore or in the library and, and, and don't start reading them from the beginning to the end. So first, sort of, what are you looking for? Uh, and, and sometimes it helps to get tips and tricks from, from other people. Uh, but it doesn't mean it works for you. But you can always try. And, and I think the most important thing of trying things is that you also should say, well, this doesn't, this doesn't work for me. So, for example, I, I've, I've, people said to me that I had to do yoga. And many people said it to me. And I tried many forms of yoga. And I just don't like it. It's just not, not for me. But it's still very hard. Uh, if I, I say that to people that either teach yoga or practice yoga themselves, they say, well, you do everything wrong. You don't do the right yoga. Uh, and I try to explain to them that some things are do not fit my life or someone else's life. And, and I like, for example, running, while other people say I, I hate running. So, uh, But you also have to admit to yourself if something is not for you. Do you like meditation? I never really tried, so I, I can't judge it. Um, I, I, I tried starting it once, and then like within one minute, one child ran in, and then with a the second minute, <laughs> the next one ran in. So I, I just postponed that till they uh, are a bit older. <laughs> I've been interviewing uh, people for almost over three years now, and a lot of them have been um, people that have done extreme things like uh, Mount Everest or... Uh, the North Pole or whatever it is, extreme circumstances. And uh, what I have, uh, what's caught my attention is that all of them, almost all of them have the same thinking patterns. So if they are uh, coming to an obstacle, whatever it is, they have almost have the same thinking pattern, the same way to think to to come over obstacles or whatever it is. So, I mean, I want to go back to thinking patterns because I think mm -hmm. that uh, that's what we humans are, we are. 
different thinking patterns. Yeah. So for a negative person, do we see any thinking patterns that they have uh, about how they view life or how they view problems or do you see any correlating correlations? Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, also reflected in the relation with optimism and pessimism. Mm -hmm. So pessimism and optimism is a, is a kind of thinking pattern. Uh, and I think th th that plays a role. And we also found in the studies uh, that that, that there are genetic influences on optimism and, and pessimism. So thinking patterns are partly innate, but you can really help people to, to transform, to try to transform their thinking patterns. Um, and I think that the people you interviewed that do all these extreme things is a specific group of people with a certain personality that is very risk-taking, uh, but they, of course, learn a lot from... Uh, so every time when you push your, push your own thresholds, you learn new things. And that's also a way of learning. Because when you talk about pessimism, is it... Yeah. So then if, for example, if you have parents that are uh, on the pessimism, pessimistic side, so you uh, can in some way uh, get those genetics as you should do because of your parents, then you also become pessimistic. Yeah, well, the, the thing is that that's a very uh, interesting uh, thing you say because parents have a very complex role. So they transmit their genes to their children, but they also create the main environment, especially in the first like 17 to 18 years. So if you have pessimistic parents or one of your parents is pessimistic, the chances are higher that they transmitted these genes to you. And they also create this environment. So we, we call that, if you, if you refer to pessimism, as a double negative model. So you get the negative genes and above that, the negative environment. You can also imagine the double advantage model of people that are very optimistic and are raised in an environment where uh, everybody thinks more optimistically. That's a double advantage. And, and that's uh, an interplay that is always into play. Yeah, so it's always there. Uh, and what people should imagine is that genetics uh, goes way back than only your parents. So sometimes people say, well, that's strange. I'm very athletic, but my parents not. And then I always say, well, look back in your family. And then they realize that they have this uncle or aunt or whatever uh, who, who won uh, the gold medal for swimming, wherever. So it, it, your parents also carry a lot of genes that they don't use that come from previous generations that can be transmitted to the child. So a child is, is genetically linked to the parents, but mainly also based on genes that the parent doesn't use. Never thought about it that way, actually, because you always think about your parents and maybe your grandparents. But yeah, but older. there are some yeah. genes <laughs> with your family members. Uh, yeah. And it's not, the, the hard thing is that we, if you, I always let my students think about their pedigrees. And the problem is that we don't know that much about our previous generations. So you know the names of your grandparents. You maybe know what the, what kind of job they did. But then it actually stops. Uh, and, and you don't know that much about their childhood, about their preferences, about their skills, uh, let alone what's before that in the genetic tree. Do you think uh, a growth mindset has something to do about happiness, do you think? Um. I I don't know. I don't know good studies about it. Um, so I'm I'm not sure. I can't answer that now. No. I'm just uh if you're uh, from your perspective then, from your uh, uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, that way of thinking help you if you're getting into for example a trouble and you have this growth mindset that okay it's, it's doable and uh, I learn from this, from this experience and so on. Do you think that it can help to be more positive instead of being? Yeah, I think it can help. But there's also uh, what we call a positive psychology intervention uh, and, and, um, in which uh, people are taught to see it more optimistically. So see the good side of things that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps. Uh, so besides uh, count your blessings, uh, there's also pe training people to look at the situation in another way and say, okay, it wasn't a nice situation, but at least I did meet new people or learned that I can even be resilient in this situation. 
Uh, and, and that's a more or less similar. And, and there are studies that found that that is related to, uh, to increases in happiness and well-being. Yeah, because I think that uh, thinking patterns, as we talk about, also about viewpoints. How do you view, view this situation? Yeah. And uh, that must uh, has to that must have it must have a huge impact to being more positive if you having if you have the the skill or the thinking pattern to to get the right viewpoint from a positive perspective. Yeah, so that's that's also one of the uh, the interventions I always propose, and it's it's very nice uh, in the field of positive psychology interventions that you can try to include it in your daily life. Hmm. So uh, you can really try to train yourself in any situations to look at the positive side. And you can also, for example, with your children, normally when you when we have dinner, for example, at home, uh, I ask how was school. That's an open question. And, and in most cases, they come up with, oh, it was nice, but, and then there's something negative. You can also try to change that question and say, oh, what was the nicest thing that you did at school? Or uh, what was the, the most positive interaction with a, with a friend or a teacher? So try to let them actually create the day as being positive. Uh, because in, in in a strange way, we always focus on the negative side. So we can say, yeah, I had a brilliant day, but and then there's always something negative. And you said, actually, if you already start with your children, teach them to, to at least also bring up the positive stuff. That positive is not normal because that's what we think. Well, as everything is normal, then it's fine. Well, actually, when everything's normal, that's very nice. You can see the positive side of it. The power of questions. Asking the right questions. Yeah, yeah, that's very important. Do you have any more questions that you recommend to use? Because uh, we easily forget uh, the power of questions because we know that a lot of our thinking patterns are automatic and uh, yeah. we can uh, do something about them with questions. So do you have any recommendations on the question side? Well, the thing that I use myself and also for my children is uh, always, and that sounds negative, but it's actually positive. Uh, what's the worst thing that can happen? Oh, that's a good If you're one. worried about something uh, or if you're unhappy about something that can really stress you out or uh, then, okay, but what's the worst thing that can happen? And in most cases, that's actually not a big thing. So if that's the worst thing, well, let's get it going and, and see what actually happens. Uh, that's a perfect question for reducing anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any more questions? I like I like questions because uh, I think that uh, awareness is also important if you want to yeah. enhance yourself. Yeah, and and and, and well, the, the 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 basic thing of the count your blessings, and that sounds also uh, sometimes people say, yeah, that's obvious, but to take the time to realize what's going well in your life. That's hard. Yeah, that people don't. <laughs> we just accept our life as it is, uh, which is a pity because there's a lot of beauty in, in daily life and in everything you did achieve and in every person you did meet and, and what happens with your family members. Uh, and and we, we have this attitude or tendency to ignore it all and say, oh, well, everything is fine as a basic statement instead of really digging into it and teaching yourself to... to to create this time because we all say we'll have a busy time i don't have time for that and and before you realize it's it's christmas for example <laughs> so, that's so true that's a that's a moment in year that people actually start reflecting but that's it's it's strange that we only do that at christmas or at new year's eve i remember the first time i heard about counter blessings and i had really problems about count my blessings and that was before i got kids so i i had really trouble finding this feeling about uh, gratitude yeah, yeah. Uh, but after you get kids, you uh, find your gratitude pretty easily. <laughs> but uh, one other question about gratitude is that uh, that I find pretty interesting, and I want to hear your opinion about. Is that uh, if you're uh, doing it the opposite way, what do you feel if your kids wouldn't be there, so that you are in some way triggering your gratitude mm -hmm. about the bad side of it? That's yeah, a pretty yeah. interesting question. So, when you're going back to happiness. Mm, are there something that uh, something that uh, we can do if we are uh, maybe on the more depressed side? Are there some exercises, some thinking patterns, or something I can do if you 
having troubles with the depression that a lot of people have these days. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, I'm, I'm, I cannot claim that I can help people really get rid of their depressive symptoms. Uh, that I understand. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are psychiatrists that are especially trained to do so. But I think that uh, trying to focus uh, on uh, the silver lining and the good things and people, but also with the counter blessings, people think that they really have to talk about big things. So because I finished schooling, but there, there are tiny things in life that you did achieve or, uh, and, and for people with depressive symptoms, it can even be, well, I got out of bed today or I did eat something healthy or I talked to the neighbor or so it should be, it's always, it's always create thought about something big that should happen. Um, and I think there's a lot uh, that is going well with individuals without them realizing it. Um, so it, I think it helps uh, to do these positive psychology interventions besides the things that you already do. So I think that the therapy that people generally get for depressive symptoms are helpful and that this can be of added value, not only talk about the symptoms and the reason for the symptoms, but also the other side of life. What's strengthening your well-being. What do you think about having a, a thinking plan? Because uh, there are, uh, you have a lot of different thoughts, of course, but a lot of them are reoccurring. So what do you think about having a plan if the reoccurring negative uh, uh, thoughts are coming up? Okay, then I have to change to that thinking pattern. And remember, they had the intensity to make this it's into a new habit. What do you think about uh, having a think, uh, thought plan or thinking plan or something like that? I think that can be really helpful. It's, it's always very insightful for people uh, to have a plan or uh, to start with uh, noticing their daily patterns and habits and thinking. Uh, so it helps if you create a plan to be aware of what the reality is nowadays. Uh, the thing is that making changes in people, in thinking, in behavior is not easy. Uh, not to say really hard. Uh, so it, it, you have to have a plan that's doable, that's achievable. Uh, and probably a, a lot of people need a bit of support. Uh, because if change was easy, we would all go running and eat healthy and uh, go uh, to bed on time and all these things. So uh, change is hard. <laughs> <laughs> But doesn't you also think that that's uh, some of the attitudes we have towards uh, our uh, thinking patterns and and our mind is that uh, it's harder to train our mind than it is to train our body and uh, if we don't succeed about training our mind one time we give up but uh, exercising we can do all day so uh, okay. does you think that we have to understand that if you want to train your mind you have to do it over and over again yeah 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 and and yeah and also know the limitations so uh People, for, it's always nice at New Year's Day, people have all these uh, nice plans for uh, training and they, they put the bar really high. So I'm going to run the marathon of wherever uh, without even trying to run uh, 10Ks before. And, and, and that will not work. So you, ha you have to, same as like stopping an intervention if it doesn't work, you always have also need to know your own limitations and accept them. And it's not bad to have limitations because people are different. So people have different limitations. And I think that's one of the problems in society that we, we don't talk about limitations anymore. We only talk about skills and everybody, if you train, you can reach everything, which is just not true. And it, that doesn't have to be a problem as long as we realize it. And if you're able to find your skills and the things you excel in, um, you can be very successful. What really caught your attention and surprised you when you did the, this research about happiness? What do you mean? Uh, was it something that you, you discovered that, oh, I didn't uh, think about that? Oh, ah. that was surprising. What was it? Well, I've been in this field, like the field of individual differences uh, for a long time. Um, what's surprising at, uh, in the field itself? Uh, Uh, is that I'm surprised by the strong claims that are made in general about happiness. In what way? Uh, um, about uh, uh, 
big factors that would make you happy or unhappy. Um, uh, I'm surprised by uh, the easiness uh, where people try to change people's happiness without studying it in a right way. So it's it's a field that wants to run too fast, to my opinion. So happiness is very complex and people are all different. Um, so, yeah, I think that's one of my surprises that we we think it's we I think we think it's easier while we know from the field, for example, of depression, that it's very complex and we're not going to solve it in a day. <laughs> For sure. But what uh, kind of claims uh, the, uh, is it uh, that people are claiming that uh, they're a little bit... Uh, well, you you see all these lists like 10 things to make you happy or five things that make you happy and number seven will surprise you, all these kinds of things. And it's also obvious. It's all about exercise, sleeping, eating. Well, there is... And I was, for example, in a PhD defense yesterday that showed in a large sample that sleeping for some personalities, that shorter sleeping is maybe better than longer sleeping. While we all think that sleeping should be long and should be of high quality. Uh, and, and they said, well, the duration is probably different for every personality type. Uh, so all these claims, like, and, and, and I think that makes people unhappy so to say, well, you have to exercise to be happy. It's not true. It's for your phys physiological system important to move, but it's not that we everybody has to exercise to become happy. It's just not true. Are there any correlation between sleep and happiness? Yeah, we see a relationship. Um, we also see we studied uh, adolescence, and of course, sleeping in adolescence is a very interesting period. Uh, but we saw that um, in identical twins. Uh, where one twin over two years developed sleeping problems, uh, there was a decrease in happiness. So there is a relationship between happiness and uh, well-being. And we didn't see that a decrease in happiness changed the sleeping pattern. So the direction really goes from sleeping to happiness. Um, and that was uh, really about the quality of sleeping, not the duration of sleeping. So there is a relationship, but it's not as easy as we always claim uh, that you have to have enough sleep. And the same with food. You now have all this uh, this fuss about it, intermediate fasting as being whoa, the holy grail to happiness and health. Uh, and I think intermediate fasting is healthy for some people, but not for others. It really depends on your physiological system. Uh, that's the first time I heard that somebody say that that is beneficial for happiness. Are there any claims about that? There are claims about that, yeah, but not like with a large uh, study. It's just uh, in this list of top 10 things that make you happy. <laughs> what is pretty interesting about the top 10, the top 7, top 5, whatever it is, it's all about getting the click and getting you to watch the, watch the information that they have. And I think yeah. that is some of the problem that we have these days, that it's, everything is going to catch my attention. And when it's catching my attention, it's always so easy. And we know that it's never easy. And uh, that is also some, that must have something to do about happiness. If you always believe that something is pretty easy and it's uh, always hard, it must have something to do about your happiness then. Yeah, true. Yeah. But I think that, um, first of all, I, I generally talk about well being instead of happiness. Because happiness is such a, a, a buzzword, True. Uh, which simplifies the reality way too much, I think. Mm. Uh, and secondly, uh, I think one of the problems is that we see happiness as the uh, outcome, as the ideal outcome of life. Well, I consider happiness to be a catalyst. So I think happiness is very important, but it has to be it has to come first. And if you are happy. You can link to other people, so uh, strengthen your social networks. You can function in society, so your uh, capital value and societal value is higher. Um, and I'm, I, I don't know why happiness is always uh, considered as the pursuit of happiness and as the endpoint and be achievable easily. I have never understood myself because I think everything it's about the way we go. So uh, we have to have some bad uh, situations to experience the good situations. So uh, if you're always striving for happiness, so then you're not going to recognize yeah, the road you're on. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the, the theory is that uh, first of all, the, the, it, it's it's sold like this by in books, by coaches on the internet. Uh, there are also a lot of people that uh, are now saying, well, uh, the field of positive psychology uh, is not worth studying or happiness is not worth studying. And they always rely on these like old fashioned things like the pursuit of happiness. Well, in our field, we're like way beyond that. We know it's complex. We know it's not easily achievable. We know it's not only the end point. So I think there is a lot of progress uh, that in the end will help a society as a whole. Mm. What do you think we have to change on the viewpoint about happiness or well-being if we are going to change how we think as a society? Yeah, well, like I said, I think we, we should uh, get rid of it being the pursuit of life. Mm. So it should be the, the catalyst of life. Um, and I think uh, we should realize that so it's not something you uh, have to achieve as the final end point. It's just it should be the normal situation that people feel well uh, before we continue with everything else. Do mm. you think it's possible in the future to choose a spe specific genes to get more positive? No, I don't think so, because um, we already have this over 300 locations. If we will increase the study over the coming years, it probably will be a thousand locations. And it's not uh, like happiness or well-being specific. So many locations are shared with other human traits. Mm. So there will never be like any uh, genetic engineering or uh, genetic pill that will help to increase happiness. The other thing that these stu studies are very helpful for is to identify biological pathways for the development of medication in the field of mental illness, for example, and also to be able to have a fundament for individual difference and more personalized medicine and interventions. But like really genetic engineering is, is for all human complex traits, I think not a thing that will happen ever. Do we know if people that are more positive get more serotonin or more dopamine or do we know how or how it works when you are more positive than more negative? Well, the, the, that always has been the claims, but you don't see it in big studies. So we don't see, in our genetic studies, we identify certain pathways, and it's not the serotonin or dopamine pathway that come up at the moment. Um, so um, hmm. as far as I know so far, it's, it's not clear. Uh, and that's probably due to the fact that we expect that serotonin should be high for everybody, for example. And I think that's not the case. I think there is an optimal balance uh, in, in of neurotransmitters in each individual. Uh, so we will never find it if we look at different. If we take a happy group and an unhappy group, the data are blurred by the individual differences. Do you see any correlation between uh, sunlight? and uh, happiness because i'm living in norway and it's pretty dark at the moment <laughs> and if i'm traveling to spain i'm pretty well have a pretty happy out outlook on things so do we see any correlation between uh, sunlight and I, they, yeah they observe a relation between sunlight and happiness uh, but also in that case uh, there's individual differences so some people need way more sunlight than other people so people that, for example, develop a winter depression in Norway or in the Netherlands, uh, although it's in, indeed way darker in Norway than in the Netherlands, I found out last week. But <laughs> uh, not everybody develops a winter depression. That's due to the fact that we are different. Uh, but we are going to, I'm actually involved in a, a study setup where we're going to study uh, artificial light and mental well-being over the seasons. Uh, and to see if we can replace daylight better by artificial light than we do now without disturbing the environment. Well, it's very complex, uh, but light is a very interesting uh, thing for people. So when I was in, in Norway uh, two weeks ago, there was the first snow and everybody was really happy because then it looks all way lighter than when it's rainy, for example. Uh, then it's really dark. Has there been any... Um uh, studies into uh, the people that are doing saunas or then uh, kind of uh, uh, people that are in sorry I... but the people that are doing sauna uh... ah, yeah yeah no not that I'm aware of no, no. are any other uh, research topics in happiness or well-being that I haven't asked you about but it's interesting to get on this topic 
Well, one of the interesting findings, I think, but that is that there's a U shape of happiness. Okay. Uh, as far as we know now, because so you actually should follow people throughout their whole life to really get the answer. But now, if you um, look at designs where they have different age group, uh, younger people are happy. Then there is this some kind of midlife crisis that we already call the midlife crisis, and then older people are happier. Uh, one of the fun things is that this was also found in uh, apes in captivity. So that that could be explaining that there is some kind of biological pattern involved and that it's not only the imaginary midlife crisis, but that there's really something going on. Um, and the ideas behind it, uh, I think, are very helpful for society. So, for example, the, the main reason why we think uh, elder people or older people are more happy is that they are more independent, not only financially, but also mentally. And, so, and that they are, they have accepted themselves the way they are. So finally, they did, after years of trying, for example, to lose 15 kilos at some point, they said, okay, trying 30 years to lose 15 kilos. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that that's also an indication that if people know themselves better and accept themselves better, that they will be happy in the end. I, I believe that. I'm, gonna, I'm heading fast into my 40s and uh, I'm really can uh, see that uh, there are differences in my way of thinking and looking at myself that's for sure and I'm in the 20s so I can understand that one uh, where can we follow your work and the studies that you're doing Mike? because it's very interesting and I like to um, like to study some of the well-being because uh, I think that we also re need to realize what you're saying that there are limits and we have to understand it so we don't uh, yeah, go yeah. it's uh, not uh, possible to do yeah, well, most of it is. All, I always put something on Twitter, so uh, that's that's easy to uh, find. My name is easy to find, I think, on Twitter. Yep. Uh, and we have a website of the Netherlands Twin Register, uh, where we also put all publications. Uh, so I always try to to get it out somewhere on the internet um, because I think that's one of the most important things uh, of research to try to uh, also translate it or at least make it available for everybody. Yeah. For sure, and uh, when you do make it available, the rest of us can understand it and learn something about it. And uh, the reason it really caught my attention is that uh, me as a positive person, uh, I can, um, I can having in some way having trouble to uh, understand a person that is always negative, that always on the pessimistic side. So. Uh, and I understood that. Maybe, uh, now, yeah, maybe now by realizing that there is this genetic component, uh, mm. there is maybe a better way of accepting that. Mm. And uh, people are, are always, on a, from a positive perspective, trying to help other people uh, without realizing that people may be different. Mm. Uh, and they still, you can still help people, but not in a way by trying try to convince them to be the way you are mm. or the things you like. Or mm. that's what people always say, well, you have to read this book, for example. <laughs> That's not the right way. You can say, well, I really enjoyed this book. Give it a try. That's different than people say, oh, this is the best book. You have to read it. That's not true because people have different opinions about it. Mm. And it's so true because I've always thought that it's about the thinking patterns. So if you try to use this thinking pattern, it's hopefully it's going to help you. But it's not the same if it's some uh, eugenetics or... Uh, behind all this it's not that easy yeah, just... that, that's i think the thinking patterns if you relate that to exercise mm. and see how hard it is to make exercise of non-exercises and the other way around mm. and that's the same for thinking but it, it sounds ideal and it sounds like come on let's mm. do it <laughs> uh, for sure but it's really hard for people mm. to change and that was uh, that uh, what was i realized when i uh, yeah. read your study on uh, no you're talking about it. So thank you for sharing that uh, knowledge. Are there anything uh, new on the horizon that you know that's coming out uh, near the next year? Or Yeah, well, like I said in the beginning, we uh, have a strong focus on the environment now. So um, uh, we did a data-driven blind search for genetic factors. We do now do the same thing for environment. So without any hypothesis, we just look at many environmental factors that are linked to a person's postal code, for example, 
see if we can find factors. And one of the factors that came out strongly is safety. Uh, so that's, I think, an important finding because it's something uh, you can intervene on. You can create policies. You can change neighborhoods. And a next step will be to look at network of events and environmental factors. So because they are not independent. Uh, and I think it's a network of events that happens why people become happy or unhappy. I'm for sure going to watch your Twitter and uh, hopefully that uh, you can uh, share those uh, findings uh, with us because uh, that's extremely interesting. If there, uh, the safety has something to do about your happiness as well, yeah. especially if you have kids. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time, Mike, and uh, I wish you a great Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Uh, can you send me a photo or something, if you have that? Yeah, yeah, I will. Thank you so much, Sorry. and uh, and uh, have a nice weekend. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Uh, bye-bye. Bye.